so far in our look through the book of James, we've gotten through verse 18. Well, we're going to start today at verse 19. Before we do, let's pray. Master, we love you, God, today. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here to feast upon the Word of God, which is the very bread from heaven, the man of God that you allow us to be sustained by. And we ask, God, that your anointing would be present tonight. Help us, Lord, to receive from your word that which you would desire we receive. Anoint the speaker, anoint the hearer. Help us, God, today to have hearts and minds that are open to receive the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help us, God. And Master, today just use me in a special way. This is such a wonderful book. And allow your word to go forth with power, God, with victory, that it might inspire faith and obedience in the hearer. Grant it, O oh God, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' lovely, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. All right, so we got through. This is the last several verses now of chapter 1. And uh, these last several verses deal with the topic of listening and doing. You don't do one or the other. You must do both. They have to work together. You know, people, a lot of people think you go to church to listen. And then you go home to do whatever you're going to well feel like doing. This is one reason why people don't benefit from the Word of God as they ought to. I'm going to tell you, I cannot go to church and hear the Word of God preach, except that I leave that service different at some level. Mm -hmm. It may be just in one little area. It might just be in one way. It just might be in... It's some little aspect. But when you go to the house of God with the right spirit and the, mind, the right mindset, you know, I made a little comment on Facebook the other day about a lot of people don't understand how this preacher, the perspective I come from. Because I grew up old-time Pentecost. And I'm going to tell you, old-time Pentecost, honey, we reverenced our pastors. Mm -hmm. We held our pastor in high esteem. And when he got in that pulpit, he might as well have been God talking. I'm just being honest. Yeah. He might as well have been God talking. Because the Word of God was so important to us. And it was, it was of the greatest importance. And that man that God called to do this job, by God, we're going to listen to him. Mm -hmm. And you're not just going to listen to him. As if you're hearing a little homily coming from somebody, a little pretty sermonette. No, you're going to listen to him as if he is, which he is in fact, being used by God to convey something to you. And that's how you listen. And it, when you listen with that attitude and that spirit, then when, as the word comes forth, it'll do the job. You don't have to think about it and go home and try to do it. As the preaching's coming forth, all of a sudden it's almost like your, your little electronics board in the computer just gets rewired mm -hmm. as that word is being preached. And you'll leave the service differently than you came in. Because the Lord, you that's why we pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. What I'm asking God to do is, Lord, don't let me be up here all by myself talking. Help me. Help the people. Help me to say it the way you want me to say it and help them to receive it the way you want them to receive it. We talked about it, I believe it was just a couple Sundays ago, or Tuesdays ago, we were talking about communication and how it's a two-way street. You have a receiver, which is what allows you to hear on your telephone. Then you have the transmitter, which allows your voice to be carried to the opposite end of the line. And it is so imperative. A lot of people pray for the anointing, and they ask God to anoint the speaker. Lord, anoint the transmitter. But if the receiver isn't under the anointing, if the receiver isn't being touched by the Spirit of the Lord, if the receiver's heart isn't being conditioned by the Holy Ghost, then honey, I'm just up here flapping my guts. I'm not helping anybody. So you've got to have both the 
speaker and the hearer anointed if you're going to approach this thing right because you're not just here to listen but you're here to listen and do and this is what James talks about beginning in verse 19 chapter 1 he said wherefore my beloved brethren let every man be swift to hear slow to speak slow to wrath for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness. Meekness here literally means self-control. And receive with self-control the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. I'm going to tell you, I have taught and preached for many, many years, as you know. And I've had more than my share of folks, Jack, who just about want to start arguing with me while I'm in the middle of my message. Or while I'm in the middle of teaching. Why? They're not slow to speak. They're not slow to wrath. Something they hear hits them wrong. They don't like what they hear. And boy, they just get ticked off in a flat hurry. This is why sometimes people would get up and leave the church service. Wrong spirit. You've come in with the wrong spirit, the wrong attitude. Just because you don't like what you're hearing don't mean it ain't so. Just because you don't like what you're hearing doesn't mean it's not the truth. Believe me, children, I pick up my Bible and read, and there's many times that it's like, ooh, mm -hmm. oh, step, oh, Lord, there am I. Help me, Lord. Amen. Because when I'm reading, it challenges me. It pricks me. And this is what James is addressing. He's talking about the need to listen without letting your emotions clutter and without your emotion getting in the way. So don't let your emotional flesh and carnal nature jump in. I told you, I tried to talk to people uh, in our, we were doing a little Sunday school program when we were in Mesquite. And one Sunday morning I told Tommy, I said, this is probably going to be these two folks' last service with us, didn't I? I said, this will probably be their last Sunday with us. He said, why? I said, because I've got to talk about something, and I know based on their personality and the way they conduct themselves, they're probably going to get all ticked off and leave, and we'll never see them again. I couldn't have been more right. Honey, you can Sean, I couldn't have been more right. I got up and, and I, all I did, I tried to handle it as sweet as I could. I tried to handle it as gently as I could. I tried to be as genteel and, you know, because honestly, I wasn't trying to be offensive, but there was something that needed to be addressed. And we had this one lady in particular, they were a couple, and this one lady in particular, we, we had little... Uh, potlucks, you know, after church. And we'd be sitting in the little fellowship area having our potluck, and all of a sudden we're hearing all these dirty jokes. I mean dirty jokes. Really dirty. <laughs> kind of ugly, nasty jokes. And you'd hear language. And you know, I'm going to say this, you know we've had some folk in our church the last while that like to use language that's not appropriate for the house of God. It's not appropriate for the ears of God's people. It's not appropriate for the lips of God's people. And you know that with certain individuals, I told them so. I preached it from up here and said, we don't talk like that. You want to talk like that? Talk like that when you're off by yourself somewhere. Don't talk like that in the house of God. Don't talk like that when we're fellowshipping. I don't want to hear the SH word. I'm going to tell you straight up. 
I don't want to hear dang this and dang that all the time. I don't want to hear all these words and all this nastiness. That's not appropriate for a child of God. I don't want to hear it. You represent this fellowship. You represent this ministry. You are an advertisement for this church. And when people hear that, you know what you're telling folks? Boy, that preacher sure must not preach nothing. He sure must not tell them nothing. Why would people assume that? Because the right response to hearing is doing. Is doing. And if you're not doing, the assumption is what? You're not hearing. Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Amen. Well, we're already doing good tonight, and we're yes. just getting started. Yeah. The right response is doing. So when you see people doing, you automatically assume they must not be hearing. Mm -hmm. You follow? So James is telling the people in this passage, let every man be swift to hear. Be eager for the Word of God. Be anxious to grab hold of the Word of God. I come to church, especially, I mean, back in the day when I was able to go to churches and, you know, like a normal Christian ought to be able to, like we ought to be able to. I go to, and honey, I'm telling you, I'd be hungry to hear from heaven. Because I didn't believe hearing from Brother Barlow was just hearing from Brother Barlow. I still don't believe I was hearing from Brother Barlow. I still don't believe I was hearing from Brother Harmon. I still don't believe I was hearing from Brother Davis. I still don't believe I was hearing from Brother Gillum. Mm -hmm. I was hearing from heaven through these men. And I was anxious. And honey, if I get into a church and I have a sense that I'm not hearing from heaven, that will find me another church. Because I'm not interested in hearing nothing that some man's come up with. I'm not interested in hearing man-made doctrine and man-made dogma and man-made tradition and all this fooling. I want to hear from heaven. And the anointing of the Holy Ghost, what that does for the hearer is, it helps to confirm in your heart as you hear that God is speaking to you. You don't deify the speaker. You don't worship the speaker. You don't, you know, you don't glorify the speaker. But you respect the fact that God is using them to bring you a word. That's one reason why I really hate the term sermon. I really don't like to use the term sermon. Anybody can preach a sermon. All that is is a little nicely put together bunch of thoughts and you know you kind of package it pretty and you present it verbally that's a sermon no if you notice on our YouTube if you notice on our Vimeo in front of the title of our quote sermon I put message mm -hmm. I don't preach sermons I preach messages I hear from heaven I pray, I spend time. Honey, I don't even speak in the nursing home until I've heard from God. I'm serious. I will sit there. There are times when the Lord doesn't give me something early in the week. And I'll be almost panicked. Because I'll say, Lord, you didn't get here this Saturday and I don't have a word from the church tomorrow. What do you want me to, to tell them tomorrow? Till God gives me a text, till the Lord tells me, Sean, what I'm supposed to preach, I ain't got nothing to say. That's right. mm -hmm. If all I was preaching, Jack, was a bunch of sermons, well, I could put a sermon together any minute, any time, any day. Yeah. Uh -huh. But that's not how we Pentecostal folk operate. No. Mm -hmm. That's not how Holy Ghost filled churches work. At least, not the way they used to work. Nowadays, they do. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, I can go into a church... And I can tell you in about four minutes flat, once that preacher starts preaching, I can tell you whether he's preaching a message or he's preaching a sermon. Mm -hmm. We went to Mount Dorothy's church, Riverside. You know, Riverside Church of God visited several, oh, this has been a few years back, actually. They had a new pastor. And actually, he was a very precious man, very sweet-spirited man, an older man, very sweet-spirited man. But he began to preach. And immediately, immediately, I said in myself, he preaches from a sermon book. 
you can buy books that have sermons all prepared and have all the notes and have all the scriptures there for you, tell you, you know, here, here, all you have to do is kind of explain it your own way, but it's, you know, it's all right there for you. I'm 46 years old. I've been preaching since I was 16 as an adult, as an adult but preaching since I was 12 in terms of children's ministry. I've not one time ever cracked open a sermon book. It'll never happen. God help me so long as I live. I wouldn't preach. To me, that is tantamount to apostasy. Uh -huh. I'm just going to be honest with you. To me, that is, you can't get any more backslid than having to preach out of a sermon book. Wow. That's strong language, isn't it? As long as I got breath in my body, I want to hear from heaven. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, there are times the Lord's spoken to me to preach the same text that I just preached six months ago. But he gives me a whole new take and a whole new angle and a whole new approach because the message isn't the same. Mm -hmm. The text is the same, but the message isn't. That's right. I may have, when I preached on it six months ago or a year ago or three years ago, whatever, I may have, the Lord at that time may have laid on my heart to approach it from this perspective or to... to concentrate on this part of it or what have you. And then this time around he said, now I want you to approach it from this perspective. Mm -hmm. See, last time you approached for, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Last time you approached uh, the prodigal son from the position of the father. This time I want you to approach it from the position of the son right. who left home. Mm -hmm. Or this time I want you to approach it from the position of the son who stayed home. Or this time I want you to approach it from the perspective of the guy that this kid was working for whose pigs he was feeding. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the Lord will give you a message that, that has a very specific, very, very specific uh, yeah, focus and purpose. Preach the same text and God can give you a thousand different messages out of that same text. Mm -hmm. There are times that I, I preach a message in our church and then I go to preach evangelistically somewhere else and the Lord will say, preach that message here. It's the same message in essence. It, it'll never be identical because every single time the anointing literally fine tunes it to the audience that you're speaking to. It never ceases to amaze me. It, I've been in this thing my whole life, and it never ceases to amaze me how when you get under the anointing, I'll say things, and I'm like, where in the world did that come from? Why did I happen to mention cancer here? I didn't mention it the last time I preached on it. Why did I mention this here? Why did I happen to speak of this? Or why did I say some people might think this? Or some people are thinking that. And then at the end of the service, I get somebody come up to me with tears streaming down their face. And they say, when you said this, that's exactly what was going on in my mind. It was like God was answering my question and I hadn't even asked it. That's the anointing. So you can preach from the same text. And even though, again, the, the purpose and the, uh, the uh, primary concept of what you're preaching may be the same in another church, it's a different audience. They haven't heard this message. You follow what I'm saying? But the anointing will tweak it so that it applies, so that you're not just preaching the same message, but you're applying it to this specific audience. And it's amazing how that works. And James is telling the church, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. I've preached and seen people sitting in the audience going, My grandmother, I told you, one of her traits, she used to love just pick apart what preachers would say. And you let the preacher get up there and say something she don't agree with, and you're going to see a big old stupid smirk on her face. 
You won't see it now because she's dead. But you would at one time. It's inappropriate. I remember one time she came home from church complaining that an evangelist had preached in her church. And he said that as he drove by uh, cemeteries, that he could just hear the clock ticking. Tick, 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 tick. He said, I know there's Holy Ghost filled people in that cemetery waiting for Jesus to come. He said, I can just hear that clock tick and I can just hear their heart, you know, just longing for the coming of the Lord. And I, and he was trying to illustrate. He was trying to give, you know, an illustration of the, of, of the joy and, and folks anticipating the coming of the Lord. What does my grandmother do? She turns around and takes it literally. That fool said he hears ticking. Well, boy, he don't need to be preaching if he's that crazy that he's hearing ticking when he drives by a cemetery. I understood what he was saying. I'm a preacher. I think 98.9% .9 everybody in that church understood what he was saying. But because my grandmother was not quick to hear, slow to speak, hello now, she had an answer for it before she even took time to really think about it. You follow what I'm saying? And this is what you get in a lot of people. You know what I love about our little church we got right now? We got good people that want to hear from heaven. And you have no idea how grateful I am for that. You have no idea. For 10 years I've had people come to church, Sean, that listened with their ears. But their heart was far from God. They weren't interested in letting the Word of God bring about change in their life. They weren't, they weren't concerned about the, the preached Word of God accomplishing what the Lord sent it forth to do now. This Cain listened so they could go get a free hamburger afterwards because we were going to buy them lunch. And I'm so grateful for that little group of folks we got today. I've told Tommy a dozen times. I said, man, isn't this a whole different ball of wax than anything we've ever had before? Isn't it wonderful? Oh, honey, there are a lot of preachers in this world worrying about how many people they've got. Let me tell you something. You just give me good quality people that have a mind for God. I don't care how many I've got. Because I can fill this place up. Don't you kid yourself. I could fill this place up in a flat second if I'd be willing to water down and compromise our message so that people who don't want to hear anything they don't want to hear would still feel one welcome and still feel comfortable and still be willing to come. But no, I don't want that. I want the people James is talking about. I want the people who listen. And they're not quick to open their mouth and debate. They're not quick. You wonder why I cut people off on Facebook the way I do? Because those are not people who are swift to listen, but slow to speak. No, these people are going to argue with you, no matter what you say, how you say it, how you explain it. They're going to keep that argument going and going and going. And they're going to debate it to death. Well, honey, if you think you're going to do that, you're going to do it without me. Sure. I'm not, you do not, not a soul in this church. There, there ain't nobody in this church standing over your shoulder saying, you've got to believe every word I preach. That's right. I, don't, I don't stand over you and say, you must believe what I'm telling you, bless God, or you're going to hell. I don't tell you that. I believe with all my heart that what I preach is a message from the Lord. Whether you respond to it or not, that's between you and God, and that's where I leave it. But it's wonderful when you have people that have a heart for God and want to hear from heaven. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. It's hard to believe that anybody would respond to the Word of God in anger. It happens every day. I got up and told these ladies, you know, I'm talking to the whole church. We only had about maybe eight or ten people. And I'm talking to everybody. I didn't, I didn't pick them out. You know, I didn't mention them by name. I didn't try to embarrass them or anything. I just said, folks, 
we have a little problem and we really need to work on this. You know, we got folks that are using language and saying things and it's inappropriate. And if somebody comes into our church and visits and they hear this, they're going to get the wrong message because they're going to think that that's acceptable and that this minister, this preacher, accepts that kind of behavior from Christian people and it's accepted. I said, and it is not and I do not. All of a sudden, this woman jumped up. You're talking about me! I know you're talking about me! Well, you fool, you just, you just <laughs> put the finger on yourself. I haven't said your name. I didn't even look in her direction. Because I did not want to make her uncomfortable. I didn't want to, you know, single her out. I figure if I just put this out there in blanket fashion, you know, then people don't have, because I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm not trying to hurt feelings. Went into a tirade, Jack, in the middle of the service. Stormed out of the building. Her partner sat there, stunned. Then her mouth started flapping, and she's trying to defend the other one. Well, really, you shouldn't have handled it that way. I said, handled Excuse me. I said, darling, I gotta, let me give you a little revelation. Um, God called me to be the pastor of this church. If I wasn't up here, there wouldn't be a church. You folk wouldn't be here tonight if I wasn't here tonight. There'd be no church if I wouldn't stand up here tonight. This is the work God gave me to do. It's my work. Oh, brother, you're not supposed to talk like that. Oh, bless God. That's what the scripture said. Paul said, let every man prove his own work. Don't tell me it ain't my work. It is my work. I've been doing this for 10 years, honey. You think you're going to step up and dethrone me? Or, or not dethrone me. I hate that. Depose me, I meant to say. You know, toss this preacher out. And all of a sudden, you're going to take over the church. It happens every day. Yes, it does. You have church splits every day. You have people rising up in opposition to the pastor every day. Do you know why? Because they are not slow, excuse me, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. See what I mean when I tell you James covers some really good stuff? I guarantee you, most preachers approach this passage and they will approach it in a much more, how can I say this, uh, with a much more secular application. In other words, when you're out in the world, you know, you speak quick to listen and slow to be angry. Yes. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be quick to get angry at people and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about as a child of God, how you ought to listen to the Word of God. How you ought to respond to the Word of God. That's what he's talking about. But you, most preachers, Jack, don't think that they'll true. preach it like, this is how you're supposed to be in the Lord. And then, of course, how many Christians you know even live that? Mm -hmm. Sean, how many Christians in the world today want to hear somebody tell them about their transgendered experience? And they'll be slow to speak quick to listen. How many people? How many people are going to sit and listen and me tell them about my life story? Me tell them about where I've come from and what, what I've been through and, and why I believe that I am who I am? How many, Jack, are going to sit and listen? Because after all, the Word of God says be slow to speak. Be swift to listen. They don't live it under the way they try to translate it and interpret it, Tommy, and they're not going to live it the way I'm trying to translate it and interpret it either. But when you look at this passage in context, you will see by the context that it's not speaking of how you act out in the world. It's talking about how you respond to the Word of God. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. If you think that lady's reaction in our church that morning was a righteous reaction, 
If you think the end result of her conduct that day was anything near what God would have had her to do, you're out of your mind. That's right. See, you let your emotions get in the way, and I guarantee you, when it's all said and done, you're going to do everything the exact opposite to the way God would have you to do it. You're going to wind up, what did I say Sunday? You sow carnal, you're going to reap carnal. She let her carnality get in the way. And what it did is, it pushed her out of a one God, Jesus name, apostolic church. The only one in the area preaching this message. You see how the enemy works? All because somebody, brother, didn't live the admonishment of Scripture. Be swift to hear. All right, if the preacher's saying it, he must feel like it needs to be said. Ouch. It touches me. It affects me. It's something that he's talking about something I do. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I've had pastors flat out. In my youth, I had pastors flat out rebuke me. I mean, just as sharp and plain as you ever want to hear a preacher rebuke you. And you know what? I love them to death to this day. And I'm grateful that they had the gumption to speak up. I appreciate it. I told you, there, there are certain areas of life. There was one pastor years ago, <laughs> and he told me one time, he said, Brother, you have a problem hearing from God. You think you've heard from the Lord and you hadn't. And when you ought to be hearing from God, you're not. I was just a kid. He so said, you're just hearing what you want to hear. But you're not hearing what you need to hear. That wasn't real nice. Jack, I did not have bad feelings toward that man. Ten minutes after he said those words, I didn't have bad feelings toward that man. I knew Brother Brock wasn't trying to abuse me. I knew he, just Sean, I knew the man wasn't trying to hurt me. And you know what his rebuke did? It made me think about what he said. And you know what I did? I began to examine myself. And I realized he was right. And I also, the Lord helped me to see where I got that trait from. I inherited it from certain members of my family who have the tendency to do the same exact thing. I've known people in our church right here who, Sean, every time they're gung-ho about the church doing something, that it's, yes, sir, that's God. That's what we're supposed to do. But the minute they're not gung-ho about it, well, are you sure it's God? Are you sure? See, when it's something they want to do, it's God. When it's something they don't want to do, it suddenly isn't God. Do you follow what I'm saying? I had that problem as a young person, see. I had a hard time hearing the things I didn't want to hear. And see, I grew up, and, I, and I'm, I try to be transparent with y'all, and I know some people probably think I shouldn't talk about a lot of these things, but I do it because I hope and pray that somebody out there who may have experienced similarly can benefit from what I'm saying. I grew up with a father who was constantly criticizing. I mean constantly. You could not do a thing in the world and get a compliment out of this man. It was impossible. He didn't know how to say, oh, you did good. That's nice. He never said that my entire life. I never heard my father say, oh, you did good. Instead, he would always find some little something. Well, you could have done this. And, and then the way he would react to it, it would be so negative and so critical. Well, what happened is, as I grew older, I could not stand criticism. I could not take criticism. God, forgive me, but I'll be honest with you, I still struggle with that. I will say I struggle with it at a different level today than I used to. Because I'm telling I'm not kidding. There, there was a time in my life as a teenager where I had such a problem with responding to criticism that it wasn't even funny. 
I quit jobs because the manager I worked for at Jack in the Box over in Fort Worth, one day he said, Charles, do me a favor, get the mop and mop that area out in front of the, the counter, you know, that in the dining room. He said, can you mop that for me? He said, you know, it's kind of dirty. So I did. And he come out after I was done and he said, wow, you did a really great job. This really looks, seriously. He, he just sang my prayer. Oh, you did a great job. Wonderful job. Terrific. And then all of a sudden he said, oh, but you know what? Look over there. You just missed one little spot over there. This is how hard it was for me to digest criticism. I quit my job because I thought I was going to get fired. Because see, my father never offered a gentle word of criticism. He never, no, he always blew it up, made it sound like the world was coming to an end. So when this man said, oh, you missed that one little spot over there, immediately in my little brain, I was hearing, you stupid jerk. You couldn't even do this job right. You could, all you had to do was mop this floor. And look at there, you missed that spot. How could you miss that spot? See, do you follow what I'm saying? That's what I was hearing in my brain. And I had an awful time, awful time, dealing with criticism at any level. People would try to offer me constructive criticism. I would take it personally. I'd get angry. I'd get aggravated. Because I had a lifetime of this negativity that they didn't know I had. That conditioned me, Jack, you know, just to where I could not take criticism. And one day we were playing a game at my cousin Jennifer's house. And it was one of these games, uh, it was like a board game, but it was one, I think it was supposed to be a Christian game. And it was one of these where, you know, you'd take a card and it would ask you to do something. And, but it was designed to, to help kind of people communicate and, you know. And my cousin by marriage, Johnny, got a card and it said on this card. Now this is 30 years ago and I still remember it like it was yesterday. On this card it said, turn to one of the other players and tell them honestly about an area in their life that they really need to work on that is really holding them back and hurting them. Now the way the card is questioned, again, it's obvious, it's not asking anybody to attack me. It's saying, tell them something that's hurting them. That's holding. Well, he turns to me. I go, oh Jesus, here we go. And he said, and he was a sweet kid, very quiet, very nice guy. He said, Chuck, you know, you're a great guy and everything, and you, you serve the Lord with everything you've got. He said, but I find that you cannot accept criticism at any level. And he said, and sometimes people are trying to help you, and you take it like they're trying to attack you. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So I sat there, and I was trying to be Christ-like. And I tried not to act all angry and mad, and you know, I kept my, my volcano inside, you know, kept a cap on it. But see, here's where I'm different than a lot of people. Because I went home, and I thought about what he said again. See, I didn't just, I don't just, when people say that, I don't just toss it away, ah, they don't have any business telling me nothing. Who are they to tell me anything? Listen, if God can talk to a man through a donkey, mm -hmm. you never know. I preached a message a few years back here in Dallas, and it was called, Do You See God's Lips Moving? And I talked about the fact that You'd be amazed sometimes how the Lord will speak to you. You'd be amazed how you, you may be just having a conversation with a neighbor and they'll say something that will click in your spirit because God was trying to get something through to your little fat head. And every other avenue he's tried to talk to you about it, you're not hearing. So all of a sudden you're talking to this neighbor and it may not have anything to do with what your area is. 
But somehow the Lord will sneak that comment in and it just clicks in your brain. If you're swift to listen, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So my cousin said this to me, and you know what, Jack? I prayed about it. And I saw in self-examination, he's right. And I've worked real hard on that. There was a time, Jack, when if I got up in front of the church and I squeaked and squawked when I was trying to sing, you wouldn't even see me trying to sing. If I couldn't do it perfect, I'm not going to do it at all. See, now I can do it, and I know. And I'll tell y'all, I'll say, folks, my allergies are kicking, but I'm going to try to sing this song anyway. See, that's a victory for me. You don't know how big a victory that is for me. Because there's a time in my life that, man, if I wasn't pretty sure I could hit every note and do it perfect, I'm not even going to try to do it. Because I can't take the criticism. I can't take any negativity. I cannot take failure. But see, I've worked on these areas in my life. And I do a whole lot better. And I'm not saying that I still don't wrestle with that at a, at a, at a different level. Because I do. I'm not going to lie to you. I do. The area in my life these days that I have the most trouble with, Sean, is false accusation. As long as you accuse me of something I'm really guilty of, I'm okay. I can deal with that. But I still have a terrible problem. When somebody comes to me with false sight, and the enemy knows it, and boy, he pounces on that. That's why we've had our little experiences with certain people in the church. And the enemy tried to destroy me because he knew it could. He knew that part of my life was weak enough that if I shake it hard enough. That's why the word of God said, brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fall. They which are spiritual ought to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Huh, isn't that a word we're hearing here? In, mm -hmm. in a spirit of self-control. In other words, you control how you approach that person. You control how you say what you say. Right. See, there's a lot of people don't have any self-control. And they're the people who every time they open their mouth, they're hurting people's feelings and they're crushing people and they're destroying people. They could have said the same thing but said it differently. And it might have been better received and it might have accomplished something. But instead of that, Sean, no. They just, they're the kind of, my, God forgive me, but my grandmother was that way. Her, her mouth would be flapping before her brain had a chance to even engage. And things that come out of her hurt people, hurt people, hurt people over and over and over and over again. No, you're supposed to operate in the spirit of meekness, in the spirit of self-control. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. See, if you keep in mind that you're every bit as human as they are, and you could fail just as quick as they can fail, that will help you to word things the right way. That will help you to approach them the right way, with the right spirit and the right attitude. But that word, if any man be overtaken in a fault, what that term fault means literally is an area of weakness that if you shake it hard enough, it will give way. That's why we have, along the California line there, they have what they call the San Andreas Fault. You shake that area hard enough, guess what? All of California is going to slide off into the ocean. It's, California's still there. But that fault is there too. And as long as that fault is there, there's a danger of failure. You follow? We all have faults in our lives. We all have areas in our life that if the enemy rocks it hard enough, there's a good possibility that we'll fail. That's why God's church isn't supposed to just throw people out the door the minute that they fall into sin or the minute they backslide or the minute that something happens that ought not to have happened or something was said that ought not to have been said. Because we all have areas of weakness. That if you shake it hard enough, it's going to give way. That's right. 
I know, I, I will give you an example. I know men who've cheated on their wives. I know wives who've cheated on their husbands. And if you knew that person and understood that person and understood their psyche and understood what makes them who they are, you'd understand why. Because they had an area of weakness. And I'm not talking about lust. That might not have had anything to do with it. Might not have had nothing to do with it. Sean, they need to have real romantic affirmation from their partner, from their spouse. And they weren't getting it. And year after year after year went by and finally they couldn't take it anymore and this pretty lady come along that was willing to give him what he needed to hear. Or, better than that, this ugly woman come along that would, hey, how many times have you seen a man leave his wife and you'll say to yourself, what in the world going on in his head? What is wrong with that man? He had a beautiful wife and he left for that heifer? <laughs> Am I telling the truth? But do you know why, Sean? Because she was able and willing to do what he needed a woman to do. And there was an area in his life that he tried to hold together and he tried to keep victory over it and he tried to keep himself in order. But he could only take so much. That's why I say all the time, I have an old phrase I've been using now for 20 years. It says, many people do many things for many different reasons. You cannot say all men who step out on their wives do it for the same reason. That's no. right. You cannot say all women who sleep with a hundred men a year do it for the same reason. That's right. See, we love to just throw everybody into these big packs. All yeah. oh, women who sleep around a bunch of whores. Right. Men who sleep around a bunch of whoremongers. And yet, if you took the time to listen, We have an entire industry in the medical profession today that is built on listening. It's called psychology. Why? Because human beings need to be heard. There are people who become axe murderers, Sean, who would not have become an axe murderer if they'd have had somebody who would listen to them. We got preachers and Christians in the world who are so quick to tell everybody why gay folks are gay. Mm -hmm. Why transgendered folks are transgendered. They have all the answers. They know everything. How many gay people do they know? None. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many transgender people do they know? None. But they know all about us. They have all the answers. Have they ever ever taken the time to listen. No. No, it's my job to speak. It's my job to do the talking. I preached a message years ago, called, a few years back, called Waiting to Inhale. <laughs> and I said, you know, the church does so much talking sometimes that the sinner on the street is just waiting for them to have to take a breath so they can actually talk and be heard. My Lord, had boy, I've preached some good sermons. Yes, they are. <laughs> some good messages. Amen. All right. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. If you think in your anger and in your, you know, emotional response that you're going to do the right thing, guess again. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. Wherefore, James says, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. He identifies these emotional reactions. He identifies these emotional behaviors as dirty and ugly and foul. That's what they are. For a child of God, they don't belong in our lives. We shouldn't even be acting and reacting that way. 
That should be filthy to us. That should be dirty. That should be naughty to us. That should be unacceptable for us. Do you follow what I'm telling you? He said, therefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And listen, and receive with meekness the engrafted word. Remember what I said about if you read this in context, you'll understand he's talking about how we react to the word of God. Not merely to somebody talking to us. He said, lay aside all these inappropriate behaviors. All these inappropriate reactions. All these emotional, carnal reactions. And instead, receive with self-control the engrafted word. Engrafted word. You're not just hearing it, but it becomes a part of you. My Lord, have mercy. Whew. We ought to have 10,000 people in this church. Because, honey, we got some good teaching goes on here. And it's not because of me. Because I'm telling you, I, I don't take credit. But I'm telling you, there's some good stuff here. We ought to have this place so packed that we've standing out in the street all the way down to a straight gay, cross-eyed and blind. Because, honey, the message we preach is not a gay message. It is a message that every person needs to hear and understand. And receive with meekness, with self-control, the engrafted word of God which is able to save your souls. If you just hear the words, don't count on being saved. That's right. Just because somebody throws you a Life preserver in the water don't mean you're going to be saved. You've got to grab hold of that life preserver. Just putting a, a life preserver in the water, Sean, doesn't guarantee your rescue. Just because it's floating out there. Here's the tool whereby your life can be preserved. But you somehow, some way, got to get hold of that thing. The Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is able to save your soul. But if it's out there floating in your hearing, but you're not grabbing hold of it, listening and doing, <coughs> don't think it's going to accomplish what it's meant to accomplish in and of itself without your doing. And you can do simply by receiving it with the right attitude and the right spirit. Yeah. Say, boy, oh Lord, you mean to tell me every time I hear something, I've got to go home and try to do it? No. You come to the house of God with the right attitude and the right spirit, I'm going to tell you what will happen. You'll come in, you'll hear something, you'll say, oh Lord, there's an area in my life I need to work on. And when you leave, it is automatically, automatically you're going to find this device in place that's helping you to act different and to do different. Mm -hmm. okay. Automatically, you're responding different and you're reacting different because there's this thing that now has become a part of you. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah to God. Whoo! Oh, God, I want to shout so bad I can't stand it. I'm telling you, I hate people miss our Bible studies. Whoo! I feel Meekness. the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. God have mercy. Meekness. <laughs> Ooh. I think of computers, especially these, you know, Windows computers. And every time you turn around, Sean, there's an update. And you've got to install an update. I can hardly turn my computer off, but there's not another dozen updates that need to be installed. Just because they've been published doesn't make your computer better. You've got to install it. You've got to make what's been put out there part of your hardware. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. And when you receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, what you're doing is you're letting God update you. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Every time you go to the house, you're letting God install updates. And as Ooh. you leave, you function differently every time you leave the house of God. My Lord, have mercy. Amen. 